Hi, it's Mr. Anderson and this is Chemistry Essentials video 60. It's on driving non-spontaneous processes. Again, those are, are processes that don't occur without external energy. We also call them thermodynamically non-favorable. Sometimes we call them endergonic. But if we were to look at a free energy diagram like that, we're essentially looking at an uphill reaction where we have a positive delta G. If we shove on it, it's just going to return to where it was before. And so how do we lift that? In other words, how do we lift that when the reactants actually have less free energy than the products do? Well, there's two ways that we can do that. First of all, we could add energy from the outside. So this is just a model, but if we add energy from the outside, then we can lift those reactants and eventually have the energy of the products. Where is that energy coming from? It could externally come from electricity, for example, when we're charging a rechargeable battery, or it might even come from the sun. And so that's how a solar panel works or how a leaf works if we're looking at photosynthesis. Another way we can do it is we can couple it to a spontaneous process. And so if we were to look at an exergonic or an energy releasing process like this, where a delta G is less than zero, that's going to be a downhill reaction. So you could imagine if we were to couple those two together, and again, this is just a model, then we could take some of that energy released in that spontaneous reaction and use it in the non-spontaneous reaction. So again, Again, in a non-spontaneous process, our delta G is a positive value, so our goal is to make it a negative value. In other words, make this spontaneous. And we can do that in one of two ways. We can take energy in from the surroundings. So for example, if we use electricity, like when we're charging a battery, then we can change that delta G to a negative value. Likewise, if we were to take in light, for example, in photosynthesis, we can turn that upside down as well. We can also couple it to another reaction or to another process. So for example, in our body, we constantly do this using a molecule called ATP. Every time we convert ATP into ADP, we release a little bit of energy, and we use that to do things like think and move and talk. And so let's start with the electricity. So if we're looking at a battery like this, why does a battery eventually run out? It's because our reactants had more energy than our products do. And so we're losing that energy. Now we're using that to do work, we're using it and losing it as thermal energy, but eventually you have a battery that doesn't work. And so how am I going to recharge it? I have to connect it to electricity. And what that electricity can do is it can actually turn those products into reactants and then add energy to them and we can recharge that battery so we can use it over and over again. Likewise, if we look at life on our planet, most of us are heterotrophs. What does that mean? We take energy in our food. So we take energy in our food, for example, like in glucose, we combine it with oxygen, we make carbon dioxide and water. But when we do that, the reactants, in other words, our food and our oxygen have a higher amount of free energy than the products that we produce. And so we would be stuck if it weren't for the autotrophs, if it weren't for plants. What they can do is turn that backwards. In other words, they can take that carbon dioxide and water and they can add energy to it. Now, where are they getting the energy from? They're getting it from the sun. And so how does photosynthesis work? Well, inside a leaf, you have chloroplasts. And inside the chloroplasts, you have a membrane like this. And what it's doing is it's taking in energy from the light. What's it doing with that energy? It's getting its electrons excited. It's passing those electrons down an electron transport chain. And eventually, those high energy electrons go back into your food. Now, who are they making that food for? Themselves, because they're going to do that same process of respiration. Now, where does a lot of that energy goes to this mole? Where does it go? A lot of that energy goes to this molecule right here. ATP, which is used in energy coupling inside our body. And so again, we're using external energy to turn that endergonic reaction upside down. Now that's one of only two ways that we can do this. We can also energy couple. And so what's going on there, we're taking an endergonic reaction and coupling it to an exergonic reaction or, or, or pairing a non-spontaneous with a spontaneous reaction. So inside our body, the molecule that we use over and over and over again is going to be ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And on the end, it has these three phosphate molecules. And as this last phosphate pops off, it releases energy with it. And so that's going to be a spontaneous reaction. It's releasing energy, 
but then we can break our food down. And as we do that, that releases energy, which we can use non-spontaneously to create more ATP. And it's said that you go through your whole body weight in ATP every day. Now, what do we use that ATP to do? We use it to couple to non-spontaneous reactions inside our body. So for example, how do your nerves work? If we look at the lining of a nerve or the membrane of a nerve, we have the spontaneous release of the phosphate as we break down ATP, but we're using that for a non-spontaneous movement of ions inside and outside. If we look at a muscle, what we're doing is that spontaneous release of the phosphate is coupled to a non-spontaneous contraction of that muscle fiber. And so again, it's not like we're using electricity, it's not like we're using light, we're storing energy in molecules and then we're simply coupling that to exergonic reactions. So did you learn to explain how external energy and energy coupling can be used to drive endergonic reactions. I hope so, and I hope that was helpful.